Okay, good morning. Thank you for joining us for the NIMSIS TAS May training. Um, this webinar is intended for state and territory EMS data managers and their representatives. Today is Thursday, May 3rd, 2018. And today our presenter is Josh Legler, who is a contractor for the NIMSIS Technical Assistance Center. He will be sharing information related to the state level data validation using Schematron. And I will now turn the time over to Josh. All right, thank you, Monet, and good morning, everyone. Uh, welcome to this training. Uh, we're gonna take the next hour or so to talk all about Schematron from a state level perspective. Um, so uh, what we've got on the agenda for today is um, a couple of things up at the beginning, just some refresher information about Schematron, what it is, what it can do. Uh, then we'll dive specifically into how Schematron is leveraged within the NEMSIS data standard and then talk specifically about state level Schematron rules, um, how you, you know, why you might have state rules, how you might go about deciding what your rules should be, and some considerations about maintaining Schematron rules over time as things change in your state. Uh, then we'll wrap up today uh, with just a little heads up of some things that we are working on related to Schematron as we look forward to NEMSIS 3.5. And I will especially uh, be taking an opportunity at the end there to um, welcome any feedback that you have about uh, state level experiences with data validation using Schematron. Uh, what's working well? What are the challenges that you've run into? Uh, what are the things that we could do better um, in how we utilize Schematron in Nemesis? And uh, <clears throat> perhaps also uh, educational um, needs, how we could uh, um, train or, or assist states with their use of Schematron. So we'll definitely have some time there towards the end for some feedback coming in from each of you. Um, but along the way, as Monet said, uh, feel free to ask questions uh, as I'm presenting this information. Um, you can just interrupt me and, and ask uh, your questions. Okay, so with that, let's jump in. All right, so let's uh, just take a few minutes with a refresher here about what Schematron is and what it does. We have two ways of validating data in the NEMSIS standard. Uh, one is through the XSD or XML schema, and the other is through Schematron or a Schematron schema. Um, so both of these are, are, you know, a schema is something that defines uh, what a document should look like. Uh, the XSD is a type of schema that's called grammar-based, whereas Schematron is a type of schema that is called rule-based. Uh, grammar-based schemas like XSD, um, you could think about it like English grammar. We have verbs and we have nouns, and verbs and nouns can be combined in certain order in certain ways to make sentences. Um, and a, an example of, of something that we can define in the Nemesis XSD using the grammar is that we could say that uh, unit back in service date time has to be between 1950 and 2050. Uh, on the other hand, Schematron is rule-based. Uh, think again of, of English grammar. There's lots of nouns and verbs that you could combine to make grammatically correct sentences, but not all of those sentences would actually make sense in the real world. Um, and so uh, you might say that I ran to the store, and, and that's a a valid sentence um, with a, a noun, you know, a subject, a verb, and an object. Um, but if you say that the store ran to me, well, that's also a perfectly grammatically correct sentence with a subject, verb, and object. Uh, the problem is stores can't run. And so Schematron with rule-based validation can apply additional rules uh, to validate uh, Nemesis XML data. And so an example of the kind of rule that we could do in Schematron would be that the unit back in service date time cannot be before the unit notified date time. So this is a rule that is comparing two different data elements in the XML data. The XSD can check each of those elements independently and make sure it's between 1950 and 2050, but the Schematron rule can check them dynamically in relation to each other and make sure that one is not before the other. So that's the difference between grammar-based and rule-based validation. Um, so in Schematron, uh, 
it, so the XSD is set at the national level. There is one XSD for uh, demographic data. There's one XSD for patient care report data. Um, and that's used in every system from national down to local. Uh, Schematron is implemented at multiple levels. There is a national Schematron schema for demographic data and another one for patient care report data that's implemented at all levels. But there can also be state level Schematron schemas where that gives you the opportunity as a state to uh, enact additional um, validation rules that you want to make sure are enforced both at your state level and at the local level, uh, but they're not enforced at the national level above you. Uh, there's a couple other um, additional advantages to Schematron. Uh, one is that uh, the way we've implemented Schematron in Nemesis, we can do warnings as well as errors. In XSD validation, everything's an error. So if you have just one uh, problem that's an error, the file gets rejected. But in Schematron, we can define some of these rules to be warnings, saying we'll still accept the data. We just want to let we just want to uh, notify the sender that uh, there is a potential problem. Also, Schematron can be updated more easily over time. Uh, whenever we change the national XSD, um, that represents potential structural changes to the standard. It means uh, vendors may have to change their databases, they may have to change their user interfaces, uh, they, they have a development effort to go through whenever the XSD changes. Uh, with Schematron, on the other hand, uh, they're guaranteed that when a Schematron schema changes, nothing structurally has changed in the Nemesis standard. We're just tweaking rules. And so uh, that's, that can be implemented much more quickly by vendors. So that means that you can maintain your Schematron rules over time with uh, regular updates. Uh, that's a lot easier than putting out a new version of Nemesis, uh, as you know. Nemesis 3.5 is, is becoming quite a, a prolonged effort because of uh, the significance of those changes. Okay, so um, if you'd like more background on data validation in the Nemesis XML standard, how we use both XML schema and Schematron, um, I recommend this document here that I created a few years ago, and it is published on the Nesemso website. So if you go to nesemso.org, uh, then in the menus, uh, go to Councils and then Data Managers. And on the Data Managers Council page, uh, you'll see a section called Documents and Resources. And uh, you'll see a link to this, um, uh, this document, Data Validation in the Nemesis XML Standard. And uh, that can give you a bit of a refresher. It's about a 15 to 20 minute read uh, just on how we use XML's schema and Schematron together in the Nemesis Standard. Um, So in a second, I'm going to just pause for, for questions. One more thing I wanted to, to share at this point is uh, some examples of what we can do using Schematron rules. Uh, Schematron can check for uniqueness. Uh, we could say, for example, that uh, of all the crew members, we want just exactly one of those crew members to be the primary patient caregiver. We don't want two primary patient caregivers. Uh, it can check sequences. So for example, making sure that odometer readings are in order. Uh, it can do calculations. So an example would be that the sum of the GCSI verbal and motor components equal the GCS total that was recorded on the, on the report. And Schematron can do uh, conditional um, rules, uh, like we expect that if glucose was administered, that we have a blood glucose reading in vital signs that was taken after the glucose was administered. So that's a fairly complex set of conditions there that can be accomplished in Schematron rules. Okay, so I wanna pause for a second. This is just the, that brief overview of what Schematron does, what the capabilities are. Any questions at, at this point about what Schematron can do and how, we, uh, how it's used for validation? Uh, feel free to interrupt me as, as we go along uh, if questions come up. All right, so next let's uh, 
cover this topic of how Schematron is used specifically within the Nemesis data standard. Um, let's start with this picture. Every time uh, data is um, collected and transferred from one system to another, the Nemesis standard requires systems to validate that data. And there are several steps of validation. Um, we're gonna start here at the local level in the EMS agency system. When an EMS provider fills out a patient care report, that patient care report gets uh, generated into an XML format. And there are several checks that the local agency software does. Uh, first, it checks to make sure that the XML itself is well formed. So in other words, it's an XML document. It's not something else. It's not a JPEG or a PDF, it's XML. Uh, second, it makes sure that that XML is compliant with or, or valid according to the NEMSIS XSD. This NEMSIS XSD is published by the NEMSIS Technical Assistance Center and the same XSD is used in all systems that are NEMSIS compliant. If it's compliant with the NEMSIS XSD, then the uh, agency system goes on to the next level of check, which is Schematron rule validation. And it checks national Schematron rules. Those have been oops, provided by the NEMSIS Technical Assistance Center and are implemented in all systems. It also checks state level Schematron rules for any states to which that agency is going to submit data. So if that agency is operating uh, you know, here in the state of Oregon where I'm located, then um, it's going to check Oregon Schematron rules in addition to the national rules. So that's uh, all of those checks should be performed by the agency's data system software. Now, when that agency system pushes data to your state, your state will um, execute, your state system will execute all of those same validation routines in that same sequence on the incoming data. Uh, so you'll check, your state system will check that it's actually XML, that's well formed, that it complies with the NEMSIS XSD, that it uh, doesn't have any national level Schematron errors, and that it doesn't have any state level Schematron errors. Now when your state system pushes it to the national database, you actually push a subset of the data, national elements only, and again, when it goes to the national system, the national database checks to make sure it is XML, it complies or is valid according to the NEMSIS national XSD, and then it checks uh, that it meets the national Schematron rules. Of course, it does not check state level Schematron rules because those are only checked up to the state level, not at the national level. So that's how uh, software systems are um, uh, required to implement data validation at the various levels. Okay, so a software system that's certified compliant at the local collect and send level, they need to be able to validate uh, um, everything that goes out of their system, everything that's created in their system using all of these levels. Every system that is, va that is uh, certified compliant as a state level or, or um, receive and process system, they need to be able to apply validation at all levels on data that comes into their system, and they need to be able to apply national level validation on data that goes out of their system. Um, okay, so why should we have state Schematron rules? Let's take a look at this uh, scenario again. We've got the agency system over here and the state system here. And the agency may have rules about what they consider to be a valid PCR. And so when they fill out that PCR and it gets uh, completed or finished in the state, in that agency system, uh, there's gonna be those validity checks and they're gonna say, yep, it's valid. But the question is, when we send it to the state, will the state system accept that report as valid? Well, the only way that the agency system can know confidently that that your state system is going to accept their report is if you tell them what your rules are. You tell them what your requirements are so that they can check at the time the PCR is filled out and make sure, yep, this PCR is going to meet state requirements when we submit it. So the way that you tell them what your rules are is using Schematron. 
you build your state schematron rules and you deploy these both in your state system and you publish them through the Nemesis TAC so they can be deployed in the agency system. <clears throat> and now once your uh, state schematron rules have been published, then the agency system knows what the rules are. And if they know what the rules are, then they can follow the rules. And so they can check at the time that the PCR is completed to make sure that they have met all of your state level rules. Okay, so um, software uh, is, it goes through a certification um, process to be certified Nemesis compliant. <clears throat> I've listed a high level overview of all the things that software is certified on when they go through that process. And um, over half of the items on this list are related to data validation. So data validation is a very important component of Nemesis compliance certification. Um, software products are tested to make sure that they do uh, XML schema or XSD validation whenever a record is finalized, both demographic data and patient care report data. They are also tested to make sure that they perform schematron validation whenever a record is finalized, both demographic data and patient care report data. And they are tested on their ability to uh, perform data validation using multiple schematron files. So making sure that they are, ability, they are able to validate national level rules plus state level rules, uh, even regional or local schematron rules could be um, implemented in the system. They have to be able to support multiple uh, schemas. Okay, so that's um, how we use Schematron in Nemesis and how software products are certified on their ability um, to uh, implement uh, Schematron uh, when they go through compliance testing. Any questions about um, how we use Schematron in Nemesis or um, what it means for uh, products that are certified compliant? Okay, pretty quiet so far. We'll, we'll keep uh, marching forward. Uh, so that kind of provides the background info for you. And I want to take the rest of the time really diving into state level schematron rules and, and how you manage that process, and how you decide what your rules are. Uh, I think it's helpful to um, think of uh, building your state validation rules from a couple perspectives. One is prospective. Uh, before you've even received any data in your system at all, you could ask the question, what makes sense for us to check for? Um, for example, you might know right up front that um, you expect only females to be pregnant and uh, you don't expect that males would ever be pregnant. Um, that's uh, a rule that you could make in your state level schematron schema that would be, you know, you would know without even looking at any data, you would know that that is a rule that would make sense to have. Uh, the other is retrospective. What problems are we seeing in the data that we've received? And I think this is a, a very powerful way to um, implement uh, data validation rules because it allows you to ensure that you're actually making rules for things that are a problem. So, you know, what if you make a rule that, uh, that says only females can be pregnant um, and then yeah, that's never been a problem. You know, you go a year or two in your data and nobody ever reports a pregnant male. Um, well, that's fine. You made a rule and everyone uh, complied with the rule, so not a problem at all. Um, but uh, probably more important to make rules that actually address issues that you've seen in your real data. So identify a need. Let's say your data system has this in it. You've been going for a year or two, and uh, you have 18 patient care reports that have pregnant males. You have 30 cardiac arrest reports that are missing a cardiac rhythm, and you have 12,000 reports where it took more than 24 hours from the beginning of the incident to the end of the incident. So if you were looking at your data and you had uh, these things to consider, what should you do? What would be your considerations as you create data validation rules? At this point, I wanna open it up. Go ahead and unmute yourselves and, and give me your thoughts 
you're looking at your data, this is what you see, uh, where would you focus your efforts and why? Hey, this is David from Georgia. One of the efforts I would do is on the cardiac arrest, um, depending on what the cardiac rhythm was that was missing. Like, was it um, the first, you know, is, is it the first cardiac arrest rhythm? Yeah, uh, go ahead. Uh, David, is it from Georgia? Go ahead and continue. Well, um, the, you know, the one, the 12,387 calls that took more than 24 hours, I mean, part of that could just be their vendor. And so, yeah, I mean, obviously we would address that, but you know, for the cardiac arrest, you know, we're switching to being um, a mandatory CARES compliant. So for us, that is one of the things I would look at um, to see if maybe my rules were not set correctly. Uh, and then that's how they're able to get away with that. But the the calls taking more than 24 hours, I don't know that you could, um, if you're talking about like the import time or the time to get it to us. I don't know that no, you can I'm write talking uh, from unit notified to unit back in service. They were on scene or they were on the call for more than 24 hours. That's a lot of calls that are taking that long. <laughs> yep. Yep. It sure is. That's a big red flag if you see that, right? <laughs> yeah. That's hard to write a schematron rule though to, to capture that correctly though. Uh, that would be a pretty straightforward rule. You can say where uh, where the back in service time is uh, uh, minus the um, unit notified time is greater than 24 hours. I'm talking about though. If do you want to set it at 24? Do you want to set it at 18 hours? Do you want to set it at you know? Yeah, as a yeah. Policy, that's where the policy right? on setting it. The writing it is easy. The policy on okay, when do we when do we want to say the cutoff is? Yeah. Yeah. Good thought. Okay, I think there was someone else that uh, had some thoughts. Maybe not. I thought I heard someone else in the background a minute ago. I agree, Josh. This is Sue in Ohio. I unmuted myself and then remuted myself in mid-sentence. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, uh, so I think... Um, what David shared is, is really right on point. If we look at the 30 cardiac arrests, 30 is not a huge number, but cardiac arrests are a really high profile uh, thing. So I would say that the, the breadth of this particular issue is, is, uh, is very narrow, just not very many reports, but the severity of that issue might be considered very high. Like he said, hey, we're a CARES state. We're going to be sending this data to the CARES database. If uh, if even one record is missing a cardiac arrest rhythm, then uh, we're going to need to track it down manually and fill it in in CARES. We're going to have to call the agency to figure out what went on. So this is a perhaps um, a low um, occurrence, but very high impact when it does occur. And that's something we'd want to address. Uh, that bottom one, 12,000 calls that took more than 24 hours, is clearly one that's just happening way too much. Uh, so the occurrence is very high. Um, and I would argue that the severity is also high. I mean, it's, it's, uh, it should be a, a very rare case that your calls take more than 24 hours. And then, as he said, there, there's additional considerations. Well, where do we set that cutoff? And uh, one thing you can do is you can set a warning at one level and an error at another level. So you could have a warning that says your call took uh, more than six hours, or I don't know, maybe in a rural state, even that is too short. Your call took more than 12 hours. We're going to give you a warning. Uh, and then if your call took more than 24 hours, maybe we bump that up to an error. However, we do know that every once in a while, there's that search and rescue call that takes three days. So you have to be careful about implementing errors that are going to reject a record that could in fact be accurate. But clearly we want to do something to address the 12,000 calls that took more than 24 hours because that's just uh, way unreasonable compared to what we would expect. Okay, so as I mentioned, uh, there's a difference uh, between warnings and errors and that difference is significant. We actually have three levels of severity in NEMSIS uh, schematron rules. We can say warning, error, or fatal. Uh, I'm going to start with what happens when you have warnings. Now, um, 
best practice these days that we recommend is for agency systems to send one patient care report at a time to a state system. So each transaction only contains one patient care report. However, the NEMSA standard does allow for a transaction to contain multiple patient care reports. Let's say that we have a transaction where this agency sent six patient care reports to the state system. And you can see the results here. Uh, one of them had one warning, one of them had two warnings, 10 warnings, one of them even had 88 warnings on it. A couple of reports had no warnings at all. None of the reports had errors or fatals. So in this case, the state system is required by the NEMSA standard to accept all six of those PCRs as valid. Um, none of them had errors. So there are warnings and the people at the agency level, their system is required to show them those warnings. Uh, so they'll see the warnings, um, they'll hopefully act on them uh, as they see them, but they still may have some unresolved warnings and the state system must accept that because they're not errors, they're not fatal. Okay, let's go to the other extreme, which is fatal. Let's say we have, uh, everything's about the same here except PCR number three, it had two fatals on it. Okay, so what happens here is that this entire submission is rejected as being invalid. Okay, so a fatal means reject the entire transaction. So we had six patient care reports. Um, one of them had, was completely clear. Uh, four others only had warnings, but because there were these two fatal errors, uh, these two fatals, the state system must reject the entire submission. So it will reject PCR number five because it was in the batch that had the fatals. Um, so I recommend that fatals really only be used for stuff that's kind of outside of the patient care report itself. Um, you could have fatal, uh, a fatal set up for um, custom element configuration. Custom element configuration is up in the header, and if it's wrong according to what your state expects, then it could, be, it could affect every patient care report in that submission. So that would be a good reason to have something that's fatal. Um, but it rejects the entire submission. That's how, by the way, that's how XSD validation works. If this submission failed XSD validation, uh, the entire submission would be rejected. Okay, so the in-between case is error. Let's say that we have this. Um, PCR number five has three errors on it. Uh, there are no fatals. Some other reports have warnings. One of the reports is completely clean. Okay, so this submission is considered invalid because PCR number five has errors. Uh, however, the behavior of your state system uh, depends on the system itself. Um, the NEMSIS standard allows two approaches. Uh, the NEMSIS standard allows a system to consider this similar to how it would treat a fatal and just reject the entire submission. The NEMSA standard also allows that the system could instead go ahead and accept all of the PCRs that were okay, that were clear, and only reject the one PCR that had the three errors on it. So again, that's system dependent. You have to check with your vendor to see which approach they've taken they will either reject everything, just like a fatal, or they will only reject the records that had errors, and they'll process and accept the rest of the records in the submission. Okay, so again, if uh, everyone's following kind of the best practice guidance, which is to submit one PCR at a time, then there's only one record in the submission, and there ends up being no difference between errors and fatals. Um, what I recommend overall is that uh, you use errors judiciously, conservatively, uh, because they will cause your system to reject data, that you only use fatals for stuff that's going to affect an entire submission um, where you need to reject the whole thing, and that you use warnings as an education or training opportunity, that you flag things, but you still allow the data to flow. So can I ask a question real quick? Yeah. So this is David from Georgia. So one of our vendors, I'm not going to say who, but one of our vendors um, that is not our state level system 
has said that they would actually like more errors because um, cause we require a certain validation score in our system. And uh, because even warnings get validation score deduction points on them, they're saying that, well, I mean, these medics are just clicking, on, you know, since it's just a warning, they're just clicking past it. So they have actually requested that for for the things that we currently have as warnings to actually make more of them errors so that the medics can't click past it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So um, first, uh, scoring, validation scoring is not something that is uh, covered in the NEMSIS standard. So that's right. something that you're doing with your vendor product at the state level. Correct. Um, and, and so there's no guidance from NEMSIS uh, about that. Um, and, and so that's what's causing the local vendor to say, ah, so, you know, we're, we're submitting reports that are valid, um, but you've got that minimum validation score thing that may cause some to be rejected. So let's go back to this issue here. Uh, all of these PCRs had warnings. The NEMSIS standard would require that your state system accept all of those PCRs because there were no errors. Right. What would your state system do with this PCR that had 88 warnings on it? Well, so the state system would accept it. Their um, their uh, validation score would be, I mean, depending on the error, would be rather uh, pitiful. In fact, it might even be negative. But uh, so it would technically still accept it. Okay, good. So your state system is following the NEMSIS standard. It would accept that report. It's it is, but the agency would get some feedback saying you guys have really low validation scores. Well, and we would we would actually require them to fix that. Okay. Yeah. So you would accept it, but say, hey, we expect an update to come in. Correct. And and I'm one of those that I'd rather the medic in the field click on the right buttons at first than have to go back. You know three, four days later to fix something that the person who's fixing it doesn't even necessarily know, you know, what the patient was doing. So that's why these, that's why this one vendor at least was saying that they'd like more errors so that the field level medic has to click on whatever, you know, whatever that field is. Yeah. Okay. So you could up some of your warnings to errors, um, but make sure that uh, whenever you set something as an error that you have rock solid logic right about that error <laughs> that there is never or you know the scenario would be so rare once in a thousand years that there would be some valid scenario that triggers that error right um, and as long as you can do that you're good with those errors um, but there are some things that just have to stay warnings um, i think the the duration of the call was a good example well the call lasted more than 24 hours i i would hesitate to turn that to an error because I know of, about those search and rescue calls that can take multiple days and I want to receive those records. Um, and so uh, that's the that's the utility of having warnings is that you call out things that are really, they don't look right, but occasionally they are right. <laughs> and uh, that's a careful balance that you have to walk there because you want to make sure you do receive uh, those records when they are in fact real uh, and valid. Okay, other thanks. Thoughts or, yeah, other thoughts or other questions on this, uh, uh, walking this line between warnings, errors, and fatals? Okay. Uh, next thing I want to think, have you think about is this question of, is the rule effective? Am I making a rule that's really going to make a difference in the quality of my data? <clears throat> Okay, so I found a real rule that, that actually exists in a state, in a state level schematron file today. Um, I reworded it a little bit. Uh, my rule is that a crew member level should either be recorded or have a not value. Okay, so if someone's filling out their patient care reports and they get to the crew members and they put in their first crew member is John Doe, you know, with his license number, uh, they skipped his level and then they put in his role that he was a driver during transport. Then uh, this rule would get uh, triggered. Um, and you know we won't worry about whether it's a warning or an error, but uh, this rule gets triggered, that gets highlighted um, at the
Okay, so that's a rule that you could have. Um, but notice this rule is that it should be recorded or have a not value. So one way they could satisfy the rule is this way. Uh, they put in John Doe, they put in his role, and then for level, they actually click on the element and they say not recorded. Okay, so now my question is, uh, they've satisfied the rule at this point, so the one on the left triggers the rule, the one on the right satisfies it. Um, but at the state level, do you know any more information from the PCR on the right-hand side than you know the PCR on the left-hand side? In other words, has this improved the quality of the data in your, in, that you've received in your state system? Do you now know something that you didn't know before? What are your thoughts on that? Not with the not recorded. It really doesn't tell you much, right? Uh, no, on, on rule, but you still don't know what their level was. <laughs> right, and on other rules, sometimes um, other not values are okay, but the not recorded is just a uh, hey, I, I was too lazy to click on it. Yeah, and in fact, the behavior that the NEMSIS standard requires of software is that if something is left blank, um, then it either be omitted from the XML data or it be automatically given a what's called a not value attribute of not recorded. Crew member level is one of those that uh, can go either way. It can occur zero times in the XML data, so it can just not be there, uh, or it can occur in the XML data and it can have a not value attribute. It'll still be empty, so it still contains no real information about um, that crew member's level. So you satisfied the, the person filling out the report satisfied the validation rule. They satisfied it by taking an extra step, making a couple extra clicks in their data entry interface. So it was some additional work on their part to satisfy a rule while giving you no further information about the crew member level. All right, so there was a cost. Um, it took extra time to fill things out. Uh, and then there was no benefit on the benefit side because you still don't know what the crew member's level was. So be careful as you make your rules and, and really ask yourself that question, is the rule effective? Does the rule actually make a difference or is it just easily, you know, is it just a kind of a busy work for someone to circumvent that rule and, and satisfy it? The other thing they could have done is they could have just set up a default value in their system and they'll just default it to not record it. And then every time this is gonna satisfy the rule uh, so the, the person filling out the report doesn't even know that you have a state level rule that wants their uh, crew member level because the software just set up a default value that already satisfies the rule. Other thoughts on making uh, effective rules, rules that, uh, that make a difference? Any uh, maybe personal experience that any of you have had with uh, data validation rules that that helped versus rules that really didn't improve your data quality at all? Yeah, y'all are a quiet group this morning. I do want some more feedback here in a few minutes as we look uh, forward to NEMSIS 3.5. Um, Let's uh, switch gears here. Uh, the last uh, topic I want to cover before we talk about NEMSIS 3.5 is uh, maintaining state schematron rules, just the process, the workflow there. Okay, so at the state level, you can come up with your schematron rules, both for uh, demographic data and for EMS data. You can submit those uh, schematron rules to the NEMSIS TAC for publishing on their website and in their repository. When the NEMSIS TAC receives your schematron uh, uh, schemas, they will validate the schematron schemas themselves. <laughs> so in other words, they will say, they'll take your DEM data set schematron file and make sure that it is in fact in XML format because schematron itself is in XML format. They will do something called relax ng validation. That's the grammar validation for schematron files. Uh, it's uh, similar to XML schema or XSD, just a competing standard, and that's what Schematron uses. 
And they will also run a Schematron validation on your Schematron file to make sure that your Schematron file uh, matches some requirements that are put out by ISO, the, the international standards organization that, uh, that, um, uh, that maintains the Schematron standard internationally. And we have a set of Schematron rules uh, at the NEMSIS TAC level, uh, certain um, things that we want to make sure that your Schematron files contain uh, so that we have consistency of all Schematron files uh, that are deployed in NEMSIS products. Okay, so you submit your Schematron files and the files themselves are validated by the NEMSIS TAC to make sure that they are valid Schematron files. If your Schematron files are valid, then they are published in the NEMSIS repository for your state. And at that point, there are a couple different ways that uh, vendors and local agencies can access your Schematron rules. They can do it uh, directly through uh, something called Git uh, and access the repository itself. They can clone that repository in their own environment and, and utilize it that way. Uh, they can also go to the NEMSIS website, click on the map of the US, uh, choose your state, and get the resources for your state. And if they do that, then uh, when they click on that Schematron file that you've published, they get a web-based view of your Schematron file. <clears throat> gives them a, a more human readable view of what's in your Schematron file. So they see the list of all of the rules uh, that you have in your file. Uh, then of course they can download that Schematron file and deploy it in their products. Uh, sometimes the vendor uh, manages that process and sometimes the vendor allows their customer to uh, upload a Schematron file into their software. Okay, so that's the process, the submission uh, workflow. The other question I want to address is uh, this topic of maintaining your rules over time. You're going to, uh, from time to time, change your Schematron rules. <clears throat> Sometimes you may uh, find a new issue that you want to address, so you're going to add a rule. Uh, sometimes you'll find a problem in a rule, you need to fix a bug. Um, sometimes you may uh, just decide that you need to loosen up a particular rule. A lot of states have rules that um, require uh, destination codes to be a code that's on the state list of destinations. So that's a rule that has to change periodically because new uh, hospitals are opening or old hospitals are closing. <coughs> So um, as you think about maintaining your rules over time, I'd like you to think about it from the perspective of whether you are making your, your rules more restrictive or less restrictive. <clears throat> Let's take an example of making, a rule, uh, making your Schematron rules more restrictive. Let's say that you publish an update to your Schematron rules and you add a validation rule that says, um, I don't know, your, your call cannot last more than three days. So you add a rule to your file. Um, if you add that rule as an error or a fatal, then you're definitely making the rules more restrictive. So patient care reports that would have passed uh, previously to this update may not pass validation after the update. There may be some patient care reports that have long uh, called long times on scene, and they were accepted in the past, but now they would be rejected if they were submitted under your new, more restrictive rules. So when you make rules more restrictive, this is the process I recommend. First, publish those rules via the NEMSIS TAC. That's right up at the top of the process. And then give the vendors months to implement the new rules at the local level. They really, it's amazing how much time they need <laughs> to do, to make changes. They usually have lots of customers they're trying to coordinate with. So give them months to make that change. Once the local vendors have had sufficient time to implement the more restrictive rules at the local level, then finally update the rules in your state system. Uh, go ahead and implement that additional rule that you added. And now your state system will start rejecting stuff that it may have previously accepted. So that's why it's important to make sure that the rules get deployed locally before your state deploys them, because local people need a chance to be seeing those errors and responding to them before they submit data to you. 
if you were to implement first in your state system, then your state system will start rejecting records with errors that they never saw at the local level because their local system didn't have the latest rules. Another thing that you can do to um, handle this sort of situation is to consider the use of quote unquote effective dates within your rule logic. Okay, so you can have that new rule that says uh, scene time has to be less than three days. You could add something to the logic of that rule that says um, scene time has to be less than three days uh, only if the call happened on or after July 1st, 2018. So that rule can go into effect immediately. It can be deployed immediately, but it has no effect until July 1st, 2018 comes along and you start receiving calls that happened on July 1st, 2018 or later. So the rule logic itself can, can contain that, um, you know, something in it that says uh, on or after a certain date. Okay, on the other side, making rules less restrictive. Uh, maybe you found a bug in a rule, or maybe you uh, added a new facility to your facility list. So um, calls, you know, all of a sudden there's a new hospital, a new code. So you used to accept uh, 50 different codes. Now you accept 51 different codes. So your rules became less restrictive. You're accepting things that you previously would have rejected. Again, the first step is to publish those updates via the Nemesis TAC. But because you made the, the, the rules less restrictive, you can immediately deploy them in your state system. And your state system will immediately uh, be less restrictive in, what it, uh, uh, in the validation. And then the local implementation timeline can be more flexible. You do want to make sure that it gets updated at the local level because local systems, uh, if they have an error, then they don't even try to send the data to your state system. So you want to make sure you're not missing out on records. You do want them to, to deploy your update, but you can deploy it first in the state system and then it can be deployed across the local systems. So I think that's a helpful way to look at it. Uh, are you making your rules more restrictive or less restrictive? If it's more restrictive, get it deployed at the local level first and then and then finally implement in your state system or use an effective date in your rule logic. If it's less restrictive, go ahead and publish it immediately in your state system and then follow up with the locals to make sure that they uh, get it implemented as well. Are there any questions about maintaining state level schematron rules? Hey Josh, this is Amber in Colorado. I have one quick question. Um, First of all, thank you for all of your, your help in laying this out. It's been extremely helpful as we just released our new Schematron April 1st, and we did use that um, effective date within our rule logic. And then we actually went and looked at all of our old rules and added a date clause on those as well, because we weren't sure how that would work if you had two different rules sort of pointing to the same data element. Um, Say if one, you know, was less restrictive to begin with, but then within the same Schematron update, another one was more restrictive, and then we were changing it to be less restrictive. Would that be the right way to do things, or do you have another recommendation? Uh, that sounds good from what you've described. So let's say that you had, um, uh, I'll, I'll just stay with the scene time thing. Maybe you had a rule in the past that said scene time has to be less than uh, five days, and then you want to tighten that down, scene time needs to be less than three days. Um, and so you don't want them to see both errors at the same time, right? Scene time needs to be, like if they had a scene time of, of six days, you don't want to have them see scene time needs to be less than five days and scene time needs to be less than three days. Um, and so, yeah, you could use effective dates, uh, like it sounds like you've done, so that um, on a particular, you know, the, the five-day rule, kind of stops showing up after a particular date, and the three-day rule is the one that starts showing up after that particular date. That, that is one way that you could manage that. Another thing to keep in mind is if uh, this is a warning and not an error, then while you are making the warning show up more often, perhaps, because the warning is more restrictive, uh, in the end, the overall schema is technically not more restrictive. You would still 
accept a patient care report because it's only a warning. So um, with, with your warnings, when you're changing the logic on those, that's going to have less of an impact than when you're changing logic on errors. Okay, and is there any concern about the size of the file? So now we have two rules written for several data elements. Are there any concerns about things timing out? Uh, there can be. Um, it, I think it's important to uh, consider performance, and I do recommend uh, actually testing uh, your rules file um, with some sample data just to see how long it takes to run. Uh, on a single patient care report, there's rarely much of an issue. The national rules, for example, um, when they're run on a single patient care report, it takes something like like 50 milliseconds to, to run the national rules. Um, I have seen some state level rules files that have quite a bit in them and take longer to run, you know, maybe a second. Um, not really an issue on a single patient care report, but if you're doing a batch of 100 patient care reports, then you're talking at that point close to two minutes. Um, and that could be an issue. So it is important to, uh, I'd say, to do some testing. Great, thank you. Mm -hmm. Other questions on the state process for maintaining your rules? Okay. Uh, I want to take the last few minutes here to talk about some things we are going to work on in relation to Schematron and Nemesis 3.5. Uh, I have, have just started a Schematron assessment looking forward to Nemesis 3.5. I'll be conducting it uh, now through the end of June. And there are three topics that I am researching. One is uh, the national rules. How can we improve them, especially how can we improve their readability and, and improve the ability for all of you to understand what the national rules are and exactly how they work. Uh, second is state rules. I'm going to do a comprehensive review of all of the state level Schematron files and uh, we will ask the question, are there any state rules that are maybe used by a, a large number of states that we should consider including in the national rules and applying to everyone? And third, I will be uh, talking with stakeholders. That includes you and it includes uh, uh, software vendors as well to ask these questions of what's working well with Schematron in Nemesis and what should be changed with Schematron in Nemesis as we look forward to Nemesis 3.5. So this is our opportunity to uh, take any uh, you know, course corrections as we implement Nemesis 3.5. And with that, then I just want to open up the last few minutes here um, to get feedback from all of you, um, especially on that last question, and especially the very last question, what should be changed, or what are the challenges that you've been running into in using Schematron with Nemesis data. So I'll go ahead and open it up and see what thoughts you have. What, what are the things that we should address going forward? Have you looked at maybe given a, or running a report on all of the state Schematron files to see what all fields at least are being um, consistently a, a rule written about them in the different states? Yes, that'll be part of my uh, state rules assessment. Okay. Um, for national rules, and this may just be my lack of knowledge, but there are several elements that are required, but um, may not be collected at every single patient care interaction. Um, so I wonder if they may, there may be some flexibility in when a certain rule might be required and then letting us know um, sort of what you decide that to be. Okay, yeah, let's see. Just kind of uh, think of jot down a note here. So the national rules, um, in terms of requiring certain elements to be recorded, uh, they always those always focus on national elements so there are elements that should go all the way to the national level. Um, but i know one thing that has come up uh, and from arizona brought it up on a call a few weeks ago was uh, there's some stuff that are national elements but she doesn't collect them or require them at the state level and so 
um, she was saying, well, now we have these national level rules that require these elements, even though Arizona doesn't require them, and that was an issue for her. Um, of course, that's the definition of a standard, is that something is required across the board, but that's, uh, I think, something that, that is, uh, maybe we can address it. Is that, uh, is that in line with what you were thinking? Yeah, and it's not so much that like we don't collect them at all, but some of the things like an entitled CO2 you're not going to take on every single patient, but it's required. So I know you can use not values, but it, it just seems silly to have to put in a not value for every single call. I, I know there are ways to work around it, but we find a lot of those where we have to be extremely flexible to make sure that um, they are getting up to the national level and we're still forcing folks to put in not values for those. Right, okay, yeah, and, and I think uh, Entitled Steel 2 is one that is not um, not in the national rules. Um, quick look here. So the, the only vital sign elements that the national rules address are uh, date and time and obtained prior to this unit's care, making sure that the time sequencing is, is correct. Um, now the XSD requires that element to be there and, and if it was skipped by the provider, then it should be uh, pumped out by the software uh, as empty with a, with a not value attribute. Um, and so that's also a, probably an area for potential education uh, for software vendors so that they pump out it, they, they realize that the person doesn't have to touch the element. They can just pump out a not recorded, a not value attribute. Great. Thanks for that feedback. Okay. Well, we yeah, are um, yeah, we are at the top of the hour here, so I should probably let you all go. Um, I would welcome uh, additional feedback from you. Like I said, over the next two months, I'll be doing this Schematron assessment. Looking forward to Nemesis 3.5. And so uh, if you have some thoughts that you would be willing to share with me about what's been working and what hasn't been working for you, um, I would love to hear those uh, over the next four weeks or so. Um, you can email me, josh at joshualegler.com, uh, or give me a call on the phone, 971-264-4702. With that, I think we'll uh, wrap up. I'll uh, turn things back over to Monet. Thank you everyone for participating on the call today. We really appreciate your questions. Um, that was extremely helpful. And um, we would also like to encourage you to please contact us with regards to future um, training. Um, our information is on the staff contact page on the NIMSIS website. You can send your um, request for future trainings directly to me. Thank you so much and have a great rest of your day. Thanks everyone.